Good evening, Calvary Chapel, Concord. Blessings to you guys and all to you that are online. Welcome. And uh, just looking forward to receiving from the Lord tonight all that he has intended for us. So, Lord, just prepare us. Lord, prepare our hearts. Lord, just speak to uh, the issues of our life. And, Lord, just keep us humble, um, yielded, surrendered, uh, completely and totally to you, Lord. Father, may our, our, our sight, our focus be upon you, Lord, just in all things. And, for, Lord, just pray that you'd make our hearts tender and soft. Father, make us inclined towards you. And that, Lord, the first thing we think about when we get up is you. Father, the first thing we think about when we get bad news or, Lord, when we get good news, whatever it might be, that, Lord, we would just continually give thanks to you without ceasing, without stopping. Lord, that our heart could... 100% be surrendered to you. And Lord, we just pray that you'd use tonight. Father, be with the sound and Lord, just the uh, just the time of worship and praise and Lord, just our fellowship and our ironing, sharpening iron. And Lord, draw us close to you tonight through the praise and through the worship and Lord, just through the teaching of your word. We love you, Lord, so much. And Lord, we just with expectation now come to receive from you all that you have prepared. Bless us tonight, Lord. And Father, be with those that are hurting, Lord, physically, emotionally. Strengthen them, Lord. Father, just keep them in the palm of your hand. And Lord, we just want to Give this night into your hands. We love you. We thank you. And Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Here I am before you, falling in love and seeking your truth, knowing that your perfect grace has brought me to this place. Because of you I freely live My life to you, oh God, I give So I stand before you, God I lift my voice cause you set me free So I'll shout out your name From the rooftops I proclaim That I am yours I am yours, all that I am, I place into your loving hands, cause I am yours, I am yours, all the good you've done for me, I lift my hands for all to see. You're the only one who brings me to my knees to share this love across the earth, the beauty of your holy worth. So I kneel before you, God. I lift my hands because you set me free. So I'll shout out your name From the rooftops I proclaim That I am yours I am yours All that I am I place into your loving hands Cause I am yours I stand with arms wide open 
to the one, the Son, the everlasting God. The everlasting God. Here I am, I stand with arms wide open to the one, the Son, the everlasting God. The everlasting God. So I'll shout out your name from the rooftops I broke. wide open to the one, the sun, the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You are good, you are good. There's nothing good in me. You are love, you are love, on display for all to see. You are light, you are light, when the darkness closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my sin. You are peace. You are peace when my fear is crippling. You are true, you are true, even in my wandering. You are joy, you are joy, you're the reason that I sing. You are life, you are life, in you death has lost its sting. No, I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world.
to your embrace, light of the world forever. Lord, I come. Bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, Sin runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, your the is Christ in song to rise to you when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Stand in awe of your name, your mighty love. Stand. 
hands Strong to the end You will fulfill Your purpose for me You won't forsake me You will be with me Here I am God Arms wide open Pouring out my life Gracefully broken All to Jesus now All to Jesus now Holding nothing back Holding nothing back I surrender I surrender I surrender I surrender
speak what is true. You are strong, you are sure, you are life, you endure, you are good, always true, you are life, breaking through. Lord, whatever you need to tell us tonight, God, whatever needs to change in our hearts, whatever we need to trust you more on, God, whatever we need to give up, God, we just pray that you would show us, Lord, that we might not be holding on to things that are empty. God, that we would cling to you. We need you, Lord, every hour. We need you. Come, Lord Jesus, walk among us. Heal, change, mold, shape, forgive, cleanse. God, do your work in us. Speak your word to our heart, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, and everyone said, amen. Hi, church family. How are you guys tonight? Good. 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 Praise the Lord. Um, I feel like it's being redundant all the time saying the same thing, but um, if you have prayer requests, call Britt up in the office, put you on the prayer list, let everybody pray for you because prayer is helps and strong. God works through the prayers of the people. And so, so if you have any prayer requests, call Britt up. Also on um, Wednesdays, there's the women's Bible study here at church or on Zoom. On Thursdays, there's the men's Bible study every other week on Zoom. Zoom's making a lot of money. Okay, and then on Fridays, there's um, uh, the church fellowship on Zoom. So everything's on Zoom. Um, Last week, I was telling you about the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit in the Bible. I'm going to tell you another one. This, This one's interesting. Um, Every single letter, every single comma, every single space is is from God. The Holy Spirit has his mark through the whole Bible, Old Testament and New Testament. Now, the Old Testament is called the Tanakh, and the five books, the first five books of the Bible are called the Torah, and that's what the Jews call the Torah. If you go through Genesis chapter 1, Count 49 letters, and then write that letter down. Count 49 more, write that letter down. Count 49 more, write that letter down. And write 49 more and count that letter down. It spells Torah. Now, that's sort of amazing, but 
not a big deal. I mean, maybe it's, it's just an accident. If you go to Exodus, count 49 letters, the same thing, same pattern, it spells Torah again. If you go to Leviticus, you don't find it. So you go, wow, that's funny. Then you go to uh, Numbers, and you do the 49 letters, and it, and it spells Torah, but it's backwards. Then if you go to um, what's the last? Deuteronomy, and on the first chapter, and you count the letter 49, 49, 49, you come up with Torah again backwards. Now, if you go back to Leviticus and count seven letters, it spells Yahweh. So you have the two first books pointing to Yahweh, the next two, the last two books pointing to Yahweh. The Jews say that everything points, the Torah points to God. And so that's, that's in the Bible. And so that, to me, that's amazing. You know, it's just another fingerprint of the Holy Spirit. Uh, tonight, we're going to be going over Genesis 5 again. Um, Pastor's going to do a, a re-summarization of it and more highlights and more insights to it. And um, I'm not going to read it because I'll stumble over all the things again, although they're all important. All, everything in the Bible is important. So anyway, okay, so let me pray. Okay, Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for that we could gather tonight um, legally and to gather as a church family. We need to be together so we could uh, help each other and uphold each other and worship you and praise you. Please anoint the pastor as he comes up to teach and pour out your Holy Spirit on all those who are listening to him so that they can learn what you want them to know. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. How are you guys doing? Praise the Lord. So let's open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 5. As we looked at it, uh, one of the things that consequently can happen as you go through the Bible is you get to those chapters, especially when you get into like Leviticus, and you're just seemingly trudging through it and, you know, hoping that it ends soon. Um, but I, I, I propose to you and suggest to you there's really never a reason why we shouldn't come with an expectation that the Lord will give to us something. So I wanted to go back over chapter 5 just to, to draw these things out. Um, we know that we have the first genealogy that's, that's listed there for us. And, you know, I think a lot of times people might ask the question, well, why dedicate so much time and so much space or such to, to, a geneal to the genealogy? And I think you guys understood it a little bit because, you know, we talked about um, just the, some of the names and we're going to kind of refresh on that a little bit too tonight. But there in verse 1 it said, this is the book of the genealogy of Adam. He created, or the book is being the record. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day that they were created. So Adam and Eve, um, God himself was the one that was calling Adam and Eve Adam, okay? Mankind, Adam. He called them one. Now, as I said, some might wonder why put us through a reading of a bunch of ages and telling how long people lived and, you know, um, when they died and, and how old they were when they died and so on and so forth. And so there's a few things I just kind of wanted to consider tonight. First of all, I wanted to go back for a second and, and look at Enoch. Enoch is the guy that we know was and wasn't, right? He was and he wasn't. Um, he walked with God, you know, with, with everything that was within him. And the Lord opted to take him home. The second thing I want to talk about is the names in the Bible speaking of and giving the gospel message 
And then third thing I want to look at that we haven't, and is going to be fresh, is how to read your Bible to get the most out of it, even if it's just another genealogy, or if it's something that's similar to that that's difficult for you to read through. Some people, as we noted, have suggested that since some of the genealogies in the Bible aren't complete, that some have gaps in them, like those that are in, in given to us in Matthew. And that this genealogy here, also in Genesis chapter 5, might also have gaps in it as well. But the problem with that suggestion is, unlike Matthew's genealogy, this one attempts to make a clear link from one generation to the next generation, giving you, as I said, the age of the father when the son was born and when the father died. And so we get the age of that father during those two times. And so we have the genealogy, and we, we learn about. We, 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 we went through last time, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, which literally means dying, he shall send. Why? Well, the year that we know that Methuselah died, what did God send? He sent the flood, right? And many others. Um, you know, so, so again, there is meaning to the names, if you would. But in verse 24 there, it says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not. Moses, you know, asked, Who shall send me? Or who shall I say sent me? And the response of God was, Say I, I am, is the one that sent you. Say that I am hath sent you. Chapter 3, verse 14 of Exodus. And so with this, Moses surely came to the realization that if God is I am, then like Enoch, he was not. <laughs> you know, it, it kind of was, a, I think, for Moses, an eye-opener, if, if you would, when he's trying to, you know, figure out how he fits into the grand scheme of things and how, you know, what his position is and what his authority is or whatever. It's like, kind of like, Lord, what is my job here? What am I supposed to be doing? And Moses surely came to the realization that if God is the I am, that the answer was that was given to him, then like like Enoch, he was not or weren't or wasn't or isn't, you know. And, and, and so there is that, that, that positioning, if you would. John the Baptist came, I think, to the same conclusion. You know, again, when you were looking at these men that have gone face to face with God, if you would, if, if that, in, in that intimacy, in that, that moment of just spending time with the Lord. And John, you know, the Baptist coming to that same conclusion asked if he was the Messiah. And he emphatically declared, no, I'm not. There's no way. And, and the thing of it is, guys, we as a culture and as a body, we as individuals desperately need to grab a hold of what Enoch, what Moses, and what John the Baptist understood so clearly. We need to grab a hold of that concept and, and really hang on to it. And that is that God is and we're not. Now, that may seem, you know, real obvious, but I think we don't oftentimes live our life with that understanding that God is and we are not. Because see, the problem is that we're constantly trying to figure out who we are. We go down for the self-help books or the self-help seminar or the radio broadcast or the person that's on with the latest new concept or philosophy concerning, you know, how to figure out who we are or what we should do or how we should minister or where we should go. And yet, the problem is the more that we think about how we're doing, you know, I'm okay, you're okay, and the more we, we, we investigate and we delve into it, where we're going, you know, what we're thinking and what we're, what we're up to, the more we talk about ourselves, the more that we make reference to ourselves and draw attention to ourselves. And consequently, when that happens and when we spend and occupy our time in those things, the more misery we heap upon ourselves. And that's really why, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm looking here again at chapter 5 as a whole, and seeing the genealogies, and yet right in the smack dab middle of it, there's this beautiful nugget that the Lord would want for us to grab a hold of and say, how am I living my life? What is it that's important to me? What priorities have I set for myself? What is it that's really important to me? What is it that I worship? What, what are, what, are there idols that I've set up in my life that... I've, I've put before God, an idol being anything that we place in front of God in way of importance and priority. You know, is there anything that has taken the place of God within my life? And, and I think we need to go through those times 
where we take that nugget and we go, Lord, search me, know me, as David did, know my heart today. See, Lord, if there be anything within me that's gotten in the way, that, that is just, you know, really uh, distracting or derailing or taking me away from the path, from the direction and all that, Lord, you want me to go in. And so it was important and it is important for us to come alongside Enoch, to come alongside John the Baptist in decreasing that he might increase. Lord, I must decrease, John said, and you must increase. I got to become less and less and less. Unfortunately, it seems like so often we become more and more and more. And especially in, in the secular world, it's like, you know, I, I, it's, <laughs> uh, we don't need to go into that, but just to look at the, the political situation, you know, and the egos and, and just the uh, power plays, people wanting more and more. And it's not, you know, it, it's sad when I see believers getting caught up in that same mentality, in that same philosophy of, of, you know, not decreasing but increasing in stature, increasing in, in position or in popularity or in fame or in wealth or whatever it may be. And I'm not saying we're to purposely become poor. I'm just saying we need to decrease. We need to become less and less, and he needs to become more and more in our life. Much as Ezekiel talked about entering into the river, up to the ankles, up to the thighs, up to the waist, up to the, finally up to the neck, and then finally all the way in. That we're lost in Jesus, so to speak. Losing our life in the wonder of his glory. That we might find him. And so, with Enoch, he walked with God. He walked with God. And we begin to get somewhat of a glimpse of what that perhaps really meant in terms of intimacy, in terms of, of just the, the pleasure that God took in the fact that Enoch walked with him. But then he wasn't. Why? Because God took him. Now, because Adam sinned and because the wages of sin is death, everyone in Adam's family tree ends up the same way. They all, each of them, die. There is, however, one exception. There's one guy that never dies. After walking with him for 300 years, one day the Lord simply snatches, grabs, raptures Enoch. The wages of sin are death, but like Enoch, there will be others who will not die. Paul put it this way, 1 Thessalonians 4.17, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. As we mentioned, I believe that we are the generation that will see the rapture of the church. It means a whole lot more to say that now than it did six months ago, doesn't it? Oh, ten months ago. And time's flying when you're having fun, right? Guys, we've seen more things put in place in the last eight months or so, seven, eight months, than we have in the last three or four years. Every single day. And maybe you read in Psalm 144, verse 15, Happy is the people whose God is the Lord, and the joy of the Lord is my strength. Nehemiah 8, verse 10, but you're feeling anything but happy, and you're feeling anything but joyful. Guys, you got to wonder why that is. Well, it's because you're not doing what Enoch did. Because Enoch had that joy. He had that happiness in the Lord. So what was it that Enoch was doing? Look at the text, guys. For it tells us there, Enoch pleased God. That is, as he walked with God, Enoch brought pleasure to God. You remember Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, we are created for what? For his good pleasure. And therefore, if we're into anything else, guys, other than that, we're never going to come to that truly, that, that fulfillment, that that fullness that God wants for us. That we're, we're being used to the optimum or we're living life to the optimum because we're living it to please God. Hebrews 11, verse 5 and 6. 
By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. You get some clues there as to what perhaps Enoch was about. That he had faith. That he had testimony. That he pleased God. That he believed in God. He believed that God is a rewarder of those that diligently sought him. So we know he was a seeker of the Lord. And truly the Bible says, if you seek for him with all of your heart, he shall be found of you. Pour yourself into him, guys. Now, perhaps you wonder again if it was necessary to devote an entire chapter of the word to list a list of men who beget and a list of men who died. But you really need to look at the entire chapter. You need to look at the nugget in the middle of Enoch. You need to look at the names because such is the wonder of the word of God. The significance of names. You've been hanging with us for any length of time. You're aware of the fact that times we're going to give meaning to different names that are given as we study through the Bible. To some, it may seem somewhat strange, and that's because in our culture, we don't place a lot of significance on names typically. You know, it's based on the way it sounds. Zipper, I like it, you know. Poor kid, he has to grow up with that the rest of his life. But in ancient times, a person's name had great significance. The name might even tell a story about the birth of the child. You know, Isaac and Esau. We saw that, Harry and heel catcher. Harry, because I, you know, Esau was like a hairy dude. You know, and, and I, you know, as you look at Isaac, the second one that came through, or I'm sorry, Jacob. Jacob was the heel catcher, Genesis chapter 25, because he was holding on to his brother's heel when he was born. And that tells me that sometimes it's, the names weren't even picked. They weren't even selected until perhaps the birth and maybe the first thing that was seen or whatever it might be might give that. Or as we noticed later with Phineas's wife, when Hophni and Phineas were killed, there were the Philistines and Eli dying of shock, not because of the death of Hophni and Phineas, but because the Ark of the Covenant had been stolen by the Philistines. He died out of shock. But Phineas's wife was pregnant. She gave birth to a boy, which she named Ichabod. That was pre-thought, I think. And what does Ichabod mean, you say? It means the glory has departed. The glory of God has departed because that was what had happened. God's glory had departed from Israel with this great defeat to the Philistines in which the Ark of the Covenant was not only captured, but it was taken back to the Philistine camp. But the name we also mentioned could be prophetic in nature. Jesus, or Yeshua, which means Yahweh saves because he would save the people from their sins. And we noted also <clears throat> the name Eve, Hava, which means life producer. In Genesis 4.1, now Adam knew his wife and she conceived and bore Cain. Cain is acquired. As she said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. And so as we look at these names and the genealogy that are given, Adam, meaning man, Seth, appointed, Enosh, mortal, Kenan, sorrow, Mahala, blessed God. Jared shall come down. Enoch teaching Methuselah his death shall bring. Lamech, the, Lamech, the uh, despairing. And Noah meaning rest. And we shared with you guys just the groupings. As you look there in that first group. Man, appointed, mortal, sorrow. Man, who is Adam, was the one who rebelled and sinned in the garden. Bringing death to all men. Romans 5.12, when Adam sinned. Sin entered the entire human race. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. And so man <clears throat> was appointed mortal death and sorrow, being ejected out of the garden. And then secondly, the blessed God shall come down teaching. We celebrate the incarnation on Christmas. 
When God came down and took human flesh, Jesus came to teach us about how to find the way back to God. And so Matthew 1, 23 says, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. What does that mean? God with us. And then the last group, his death shall bring the despairing, that's us, rest. And Jesus Christ would die on the cross in order to pay for our sins. And if we were to just but trust in him, we would find forgiveness with God and rest for our souls. Therein, just in that genealogy, guys, you have the gospel. You have the good news. So don't, I guess what I'm saying is don't ever look at something, a portion of scripture, a portion of the word as you're reading. Don't, don't ever try to avoid certain sections because, oh, no, you know. <clears throat> but go with an expectation of receiving something from the Lord. And that's what I wanted to really finish with tonight is how to learn how to read your Bible. Because there's a message in every single section that you will read. Just as there's a message there in Genesis chapter 5. It's a message of hope. It's a message of the good news of Jesus Christ. That even though man blew it, and even though man rebelled against God, that God himself would one day make things right. That God would make a way back to him. And so the invitation is open for you to come back to God. The God of second chances there. Now, we also said that the end of chapter 5 is the end of the first section of Genesis, which deals with creation. And it's the beginning of a new section when we get into next week, chapter 6. It's going to deal with the destruction of all that was created. So you're given creation in chapters 1 through 5, and then the destruction of that creation, save for one human family and a boatload of fortunate animals. But for a second, turn your attention to Joshua. In Joshua chapter 1, verse 8, it says, The book, this book of the law, shall not depart from your mouth. But you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Is there anybody here that doesn't want to have a prosperous life or a way that's prosperous and good success? So you all can stay. <clears throat> Meditate day and night that you may observe it. Perhaps no one epitomized good success more than Job. He who was the most prosperous and successful man on the face of the earth in his day said this in Job 23 verse 12. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. In other words, if Job had our Bible, he would have said, if it's a choice between breakfast and the Bible, I choose the Bible. If it's lunch or Luke, I'll take Luke. If it's dinner or Daniel, hey, I got Daniel. For nothing will have priority for me over the reading of scriptures, not even eating. You see, Job lived out what Joshua promised. And that is that he had genuine prosperity and great success. Now you might be thinking, yeah, but that's only part of the story. He had a lot of troubles as well. Yes, he did. But when everything fell apart in a single day, his family destroyed, his health demolished, his material blessings decimated, do you remember what Job said? Chapter 1, verse 21. He said, 
The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives abundantly and the Lord takes away. Job went through his trial and he came out on the other side twice as blessed. Just look at chapter 42 around verse 12. And so tonight, this is what I want to suggest to you. That if you want prosperity, and I'm not talking about, I want to be rich, I want to win the lottery. No, I'm not talking about that. There's more to prosperity than just financial gain. If you want prosperity, if you want good success, the best piece of advice you can follow is to be one like Job who is committed to reading, committed to studying, and committed to meditating upon the Word of God. Guys, I cannot tell you, it makes all the difference in the world. Now, you might be thinking at this point, oh, Joe, you know, I've tried reading through the Bible. I just never seem to get it. If you've felt like that before, let me give to you, take out your paper, take out your pencil, If you don't have one, find one somewhere. Steal from your neighbor. Do something. I want to get you guys in the habit of this, though. I want to give to you four simple yet very significant keys which I believe will help you in your study of God's Word, especially chapters like chapter 5 of Genesis. And so, number one, first key, Read consistently. Read consistently. The first key to to reading the Word of God is to read the Bible with consistency from cover to cover, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Read the Bible consistently. And I would say to you, don't worry about those things that you don't understand. If you're reading through the Bible, you'll come across some things that will confuse you initially. But there will be also a bunch of things that will jump out at you. Important things for you to do and essential things for you to know. Maybe you've wondered, why does the Lord make the Word and the Scripture so difficult in so many ways? I mean, come on. Why couldn't you have just simply written a section on marriage, a section on finance, a section on parenting, and so on and so forth. Why all the stories and rules and ordinances and parables and pictures and types and illustrations? Why do we wade through all that stuff? Well, Solomon, another prosperous man, you might say, shed light on this question when he wrote in Proverbs 25, verse 2. Listen to this. It is the glory of of God to conceal a thing. But the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Let me read that again. It's the glory of God to conceal a thing. But the honor of kings is to search out a matter. Did you know that God purposely conceals some things because even though initially a certain story, a passage, or a section of Scripture may not make sense to you, as you meditate on it and pray about it and wrestle with it, maybe a week or a month or a year later, when that light goes on, and you finally understand it, guess what? You will never forget it. You'll never forget it. I have often found that the passages with which I wrestle the longest are the passages I learn the deepest that never depart, that never leave. How many wonderful truths I would have missed had I not read the word consistently. Even 
when I didn't necessarily understand it. Jesus promised the Holy Spirit will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. John chapter 14, verse 26. I will bring all things to your remembrance. In other words, the Holy Spirit will bring to our minds and make application of that which the Lord has said to us in his word. He'll bring it. He'll bring the at the point of application, at the point of when you most need it. The Lord will bring that truth to your mind. The downside of that is he won't bring and can't bring to mind what you haven't read. So read consistently. I'll never forget one of the first times I went water skiing. I was in high school. A friend and I went with a group who were pretty good skiers. And we went up to Lake Nacimento near Paso Robles. And I never forget watching as each one of the members of the group went out and some started in the water and some started in the shore and, you know, they made it look so easy. Oh, made me sick. And, and I was dreading my turn, you know, thinking the whole while, this is not going to turn out well. Finally, the time came for me to strut myself and I remember getting in the water. You know how, you know, you're trying to wrestle with the rope. You got to lay it between the skis and, you know, you keep tipping over, and it's like, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's really, you know, not an easy, it wasn't easy for me to learn, and, and you're struggling, and you're trying to tread water with these big old, you know, skis on, but finally, the time came, and it was like, hit it, you know, <laughs> womp, and splat, you know, and right on my face, you know, over and over again, you just wanted it to end. He just wanted somebody else to let him go. But I remember the next time it was my turn, I actually got up, well, sort of. Because they pushed the throttle, and I actually came up, lost my balance, sat back down. And then, you know, as I was doing that, the spotter in the boat to the driver was going, he's up, he's down, oh, and it had just the opposite effect on me because the guy kept going, he's up, he's down, he's up, he's down. And he kept going, boom, boom, boom. And I kept going, boom, 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 you know. It was horrible. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and so here I was, you know, just a mess. But as the day began to end, I decided to try one last time. And so I got into position and I yelled out, hit it. This time I shot right up. And man, it was amazing because by that time of the day, the water had calmed. In the evening, it was like glass. And you could just cut through it like hot knife through butter. And as I, I, I rode through it, man, it was just awesome. It was absolutely awesome. The point of this, though, is that when you learn to ski, you find yourself initially going, I don't get this. <laughs> I really don't get this. I mean, this is miserable. It's embarrassing. I'm wet. I'm cold. Why even bother? But when suddenly it all comes together and you find yourself just sailing right along and going over wake waves and, and just going crazy, cutting through glassy water, running away out by the side of the boat, you know, and, and the whole nine yards. That's the way it is with reading the Word of God, guys. We say, you know, I don't get this. I really don't. What does this mean? And what's this all about? But then if you just keep doing it, it begins to click. The pieces begin to fit together. The applications are made, the tie-ins are there. And that's why it's an honor and it's a joy to search out what God has concealed. What God has concealed, it's a glory to God. You see, the armies of Israel and Judah arrayed in the desert of Edom for battle 
against the armies of Moab. They were, were told in the scripture, 2 Kings chapter 3, desperately in need of water. And so the prophet Elisha declared, Thus saith the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. Make the valley full of ditches, right. Do we have any other prophets? <laughs> some, some other word from the Lord. But they listened and ditches were dug. And they went to bed that night sore. The next morning they woke up and the ditches were filled with water. Guys, if you want to be full of the water of the word of God, you got to just keep digging and digging and digging consistently. Even in the dry times. Even when you don't feel like it. Because I know that as I dig those ditches consistently, they will be filled with the water of the word eventually. Amen? And so read consistently. Number two, read expectantly. Wondering why God was doing certain things and why he wasn't doing the other things. Habakkuk to the Lord said, I will go up into the high tower and I will wait and see what the Lord will say to me. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 1. Well, the Lord indeed spoke to Habakkuk. And he said in Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 2, write the vision. Guess what? Habakkuk didn't have to borrow a piece of paper and he didn't have to borrow a pencil or a scroll or a scribe or a whatever they call it, a pen. He was ready to go. So what does it mean to read with expectancy? I believe that it means you come to your devotions and you come to the Bible studies, you come to church with a piece of paper and a pencil in hand. And yet you're ready to take note of that which the Lord would want to speak to you at that particular time. I wonder if in our morning, morning devotions and in our study times, if we were not speaking volumes through our casual, our lethargic approach, how we come in ill prepared with no expectation, no anticipation of, Lord, I know you have something for me tonight. Maybe just one nugget, but I know that you have something for me and I've come with an expectation. I've come anticipating, Lord, that you will feed me with your word. No wonder when we don't come that way that the Lord doesn't speak to us. No wonder that the word isn't real to us. Saints, I want you to do well. And that comes by approaching the word with anticipation, with expectation. Hebrews 11, verse 6, For he that comes to God must believe he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. And he will reward you. So read consistently. Read with an expectation, expectantly. Number three, read conversationally. What are you talking about? As Daniel read the writings of Jeremiah, he all of a sudden realized and it dawned on him that it was time for Israel's release from Babylon. That it was drawing near and not too far in the future. So what did Daniel do? Daniel sought the Lord and he asked the Lord what his people should do in light of Jeremiah's prophecy. Daniel chapter 9 verses 2 and 3. I have found this to be so important uh, to me, guys, in terms of what it says. And that is, as I read the word, I pray. I read a sentence or two, and you might remember this from praying through the temple, guys. Uh, that time when we come to the washing of the word 
and the labor. And we come to that point and we begin to read the word of God, a scripture that's on our heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he'll direct your paths. And we say, Lord, trust in you. Help me, Lord, to trust in you. And there's that conversation, if you would. And I found it so important in my time of prayer and in my time of studying and reading the word of God. That as I read the word of God, I pray. I read a sentence or two and I'll stop and I'll talk it over with the Lord. Lord, what are you saying here? Lord, how does this apply to me? Lord, what are you trying to say? You see, true communication requires two-way conversation. I've shared with you before, if I said to Dottie, listen very carefully, I'm going to talk to you for 15 minutes. And I began, talk, 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 talk. And then I stop and I say, okay, now it's your turn. And she talks. Talk, 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 talk. Talk, 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 talk. If she talks to me, our conversation would not be very natural nor would it be very intimate. If on the other hand, I said a sentence or two, and she said a sentence or two, and we responded to each other conversationally, true communication would take place. I'm convinced that that's the way it's supposed to be in our spiritual walk, in our spiritual life. I used to think it was, okay, Lord, you talk to me through the scripture. Read, 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 read. Now I'll talk to you through prayer. Pray, 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 pray. And although we can communicate that way, it's still very stilted or artificial, not very intimate. That's why I suggest you read a verse or two or three and talk to the Lord about what you read. If you do, you will find yourself truly communicating with, truly hearing from the Lord. The same holds true in a corporate setting. For if you pray as the word, even as we're right now teaching the word of God, and you hear something and you just say, Lord, you know, help me to assimilate that truth. Help me to hold on to that truth. Help me not to lose that, that word of knowledge, or that word of wisdom, you see. Just softly to yourself, just pray. As you're going, as we're going through the word of God, Lord, help me. Because if you pray as the word is being taught, you will find yourself engaged and growing rather than bored and drifting. If you hear something that convicts you in a sermon or a study and you say, Father, I hear what you're saying on that. And, and I know it applies to me. Forgive me for the way that I treated that person today. You know, right where you're sitting. You don't have to get on your knees. You don't have to leave your seat. You're just right where you're at. If you hear something comforting, say, Lord, thank you for that promise. I needed that. If you learn to pray as you're studying corporately, if you learn to pray while you're reading the scriptures personally, individually, then the word will come to life for you in ways that will warm your heart and absolutely blow your mind. Amen. So read consistently, read expectantly, read conversationally. Number four, and this is a tough one, read obediently. Simply put, our Lord is so awesomely kind that he's not about to load us down with a whole bunch of stuff which causes our spiritual desk to stack up with papers. He's not going to overburden you guys. He will not allow my spiritual inbox, so to speak, to fill up to the point where it's overflowing, overwhelming, and depressing. Instead, he graciously gives me only one thing to do at a time. You ever notice that? Anybody that says they have more than one thing to do, I, I have to wonder if it's because they 
put it on the to-do list rather than God. That's why it's so important that we wake each morning and say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Direct me, Lord, and you tell me what you want me to do. You set the agenda. Amen. But guys, he's not going to overflow and overwhelm you. But graciously gives you one thing at a time. To those who say, I just don't get anything out of the Bible study. I don't get anything out of the morning devotions. My question is, have you done the last thing that God told you to do? Because oftentimes that'll gum up the works. After all, why should God give us more information and more instruction and more input if we have not been obedient to what he's already brought to our attention? Remember, we were talking about this with Philip. I want you to go down from here, Samaritan, our Samarita. And I want you to go down to, on the road to Gaza. And I want you, and you're going to see a guy in a chariot there and boom, boom, boom. He just basically says, Go. He doesn't give him the whole plan. Abraham, go from the land of Chaldeans. I'm not going to tell you everything. I'm not going to tell you the whole plan. I just want you to take one step at a time. And when you finish the first step, then I'll let you know what step two is. But we want everything laid out. And we say, if it's not laid out, then oftentimes we don't do it. And if we don't do it, there's so much that we miss. You see, have you done the last thing that God told you to do? Because he's not going to give you the next thing until the first thing he asks you to do and that you're obedient to what he's already brought to your attention. Then he'll give you the second step. In the midst of a huge revival, as I said, God told Philip, go to the desert. Philip obeyed and he was able to share the word with a man who in turn so impacted Ethiopia and Africa with the gospel that the effects can still be seen today. Back in Acts chapter 8. God won't give you 15 things to do. He simply gives you one thing at a time. And I have found that as I do the one thing the Lord asks me, then he proceeds to take me to the next step. That is why we're to be doers of the word and not just hearers only, James 1.22. For it is when we say, Lord, you are God. And with your grace and by your strength, I desired and I determined to do whatever you say, Lord. It's then that he will open the doors before you and give direction to you. And so guys, read with consistency. Read with expectancy. Don't approach the word half-heartedly. Don't approach the word lethargically, but come with an expectation, not apathetical, but come with an anticipation. Don't be lazy, but come ready to receive, expecting to receive. Read conversationally. Pray while you read. Read while you pray. And read obediently. When God speaks to your heart, do what he tells you to do, and more revelation will follow. Guys, in the course of my 50-year pilgrimage with the Lord, I have found these elements to be essential to my love of and for, my understanding of, and my delight in the Word of God. Make the Word real to you guys. Give yourself every advantage in order to see that a reality. And know that your life will be prosperous and that you will experience good success. Amen. Well, Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this little than yet, Lord, that you have given to us. Thank you for, Lord, just the example of Genesis chapter 5. And Lord, I just would ask that, God, you would just speak to each and every heart, my heart included, regarding, Lord, your word. Father, just the consistency in our life with an expectancy, Lord, and obedience, Father. Just each and every one of these things, these, these principles, Lord, I pray that you by your Holy Spirit would just apply them to our lives. That, Father, our lives would be fruitful. Not that we would have everything we want. That's not, that's not the prosperity that you're talking about. But that, Lord, we would
would just enjoy a, a prosperous walk in you. Lord, a good success, Father, in the things that we put our hand to. Ever realizing that, Lord, you could be all taken away in a moment. But, Father, that you, Lord, would bless. Bless our lives. You know, again, not with things, but, Lord, with your presence, with your hand upon us. That, Lord, the things of you, the things of sharing your word, Lord, and, Father, being a witness and a testimony of your grace and your mercy and your love. That, Father, you would cause us to prosper in these things. That, Lord, you would be glorified in and through our lives. We love you, Father. We thank you for this time in your word. And we pray that, Father, you would just cause it to take root and abundantly, again, bear forth fruit in our lives and in our walks. We love you. And we praise you, Lord. Help us to be attentive. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen? God bless you guys. God bless you guys.